Now, uh, I'm sure you're all super keen to start hearing from some of our amazing speakers, and I am too. So from now until about 10 o'clock, we're going to be hearing from uh, four quite inspiring and awesome speakers who are going to help us to begin to set the context, define the terms, get on the same page so that we can start this journey through open together. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sasha Meinrath to the stage. So I arrived in New Zealand about a week ago and immediately jumped into a juicy caravanner thing that I didn't even know existed until I got here. It was awesome. Went all around the South Island and was completely stunned. I mean, really stunned by the natural beauty of this country. And it, it was clear that in New Zealand there's a sense of stewardship over this resource. And I think tech, like the environment, is an ecosystem. And it's one that we have to curate, and it's one that we have to protect. And it's a commons that can often be abused, as well as one that can become a sort of a monoculture or otherwise become something that is quite devastated, over-specialized, fragile. And I think that key decision makers are like robber barons, right? The, the corporate elite are like the robber barons of the late 19th century. Uh, they're extracting resources. They're extracting resources in terms of your money, right? You're paying more for worse internet service in New Zealand than a growing list of other countries around the globe. Your privacy, as Edward Snowden has made abundantly clear, and very soon your, your, your livelihoods. Oh, great. Right, the technology is quickly displacing folks and key decision makers are ignoring those impacts on our societies. In fact, it's all your problem now to figure out what do you do when automated vehicles displace trucking, for example. And I think fundamental change, whoa, now it's going fast. Fundamental change throughout history has always come in these fits and spurts, whether you're talking about hunter-gatherers, whether you're talking about agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and now we've got this technological revolution that we are a part of. In fact, I would argue that all of us are this vanguard that actually, because we are an elite in terms of using, understanding, thinking about technology, that we then have an onus, a responsibility to explain what technological reality looks like to key decision makers. To stand up and fight for the better alternatives that are possible. Because we're actually laying a foundation for a 21st century civil society. And when we're successful, and we often are successful, we're achieving sort of a more liberatory environment for everyone. And when we fail, when we're not successful, Technology can be predatory, it can be invasive, it can be oppressive. And that's fundamentally what it's, this is about. This is a fight between a future where we have this incredible, inclusive, liberatory, participatory, participatory democracy potential, and a future that looks more like what I call digital feudalism, where we're locked in, disempowered, where we have sort of masters that control ever-increasing array of different facets of our lives without us even fully comprehending it. For my own part, open source, open society is something that I've been working on now for about 15 years. Whether it's through something called indie media and helping build that global network, or building something called the Community Wireless Initiative, and QN was a part of that, the Champaign-Urbana Community Wireless Network and Commotion, and then leading into my work in DC. And DC is actually what I want to talk with you about, because I see it as an exemplar of everything wrong right now. So here's DC today, and I'm using one example inside DC, and I'll say very briefly, what's wrong is too many lawyers. Lawyers in DC are like our stoat, right? Like they, they're our possum, and they've infested everything and displaced the natural creatures that should be at the FCC in this example. Because what you have 
are key decisions about the future of communications, probably one of the most important technologies, period, being decided by a bunch of people that have almost no technological acumen. This should scare the bejesus out of everybody. <laughs> Because what it means is people are making decisions rather blindly. And if you think the FCC is a problem, let me tell you, as soon as you get to Congress, it's even worse. That the average congressional member is, you know, like geriatric to begin with. We've, we recently had a whole thing where a bunch of them were talking about how they never use email. And I'm like, well, how the hell are you voting on surveillance of the NSA if you have no comprehension about what that even is that they're doing. And let me show you what congressional gridlock looks like. So this is from right after World War II to present day. And what you have here is the number of bills being introduced declining and the percentage of bills that are actually being passed declining. And so I don't know if you can see this little blue bar at the bottom. That's the number of bills that have been passed. And it's approaching zero, which unto itself would be a huge problem, except we have this other thing, which is that technological change is increasing. So if the knee of the curve here is the introduction of the internet to society, of digital technology to society, What's happening is the rate of change of technology, the way that it is infiltrating different facets of our lives is increasing. The complexity is increasing. And the knowledge base of Congress is proceeding at a very low pace, which means that this gulf of ignorance between technological reality and what people understand, the people that are making decisions over technology is increasing dramatically and will in, in continue to increase dramatically. And again, this is a huge problem. So in the 2000s, from 2008 onward, I created something called the Open Technology Institute in Washington, D.C. Grew it to a staff of over 50 people, multi, multi-million dollar endeavor, a public interest tech tank working to bring technological expertise to D.C. And what I learned doing that is like by the time we were engaged in discussions over what had gone wrong, we were already fighting a defensive battle. And so I created XLab, which I'll talk a little bit about, in order to be a vanguard that's looking three to five years ahead so that we can actually educate key decision makers today about what's coming so that that gulf of ignorance is at least lessened, if not eliminated. Now, I would argue that XLab and work that we're doing here and that you are doing in your everyday lives is the key element to safeguarding this technology ecosystem, to safeguarding participatory democracy into the next century. So what I do at XLab is things like this, talking about the future of war, right? So whether I'm briefing White House officials or folks over at the defense uh, industry, talking to them about what that future looks like. Most Congress thinks it's like this big burly guy with advanced weaponry. And that should scare you because they're not preparing for what's actually going to arrive. But also we do a lot of work on things like distributed production. Right? What scares me, what scares Congress is the 3D printed gun. That's what everyone always talks about. What scares me is the 3D printed car part. Because once you're able to build de facto equivalents in a distributed manner, entire supply chains collapse. We're not just talking about retail, we're talking about everything leading up to that retail space. Shipping collapses, right? The number one job in America for middle class is trucking. And trucking requires a certain number of widgets to be transported from point A to point B. And again, no one's preparing for that, and that scares me. Smart infrastructure, this is a big buzzword in the US, the self-driving car that everyone talks about, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll never get there, by the way. We'll never get to the self-driving car until we have tort reform because of liability. The Google can never program a car that could break the law. 
And in any major city, you can't drive from point A to point B without breaking the law. <laughs> and that pro that's a serious problem. Privware, uh, this is actually a picture uh, from a event that I had was presenting at in Silicon Valley. And every single person was talking about how great the Internet of Things was going to be because we're going to be able to commoditize all of this information that everyone's collecting. And I'm up on stage and I'm like, is anyone here scared <laughs> about all of this data collection? But the dominant business model, I would say almost the only business model for the Internet of Things is to commercialize all of your privacy. That's the business model, not selling widgets, collecting data about you. And again, that should worry everyone. Circumvention tech, we do a lot on safeguarding communications. I'll talk a little bit more about this both uh, later today and tomorrow. But this was started before Snowden. It's a little more relevant to most people today post Snowden, but it's an incredibly important area. And finally, commotion, which I'll actually speak on, I think, later today, uh, which is a large scale wireless research and development initiative that we coordinate. So, if that's what I'm doing there, what I'm really hoping to get out of here, and what I hope is kind of inspiring or aspirational for everyone that is here, is to learn about everything else that's going on. My work is predicated upon learning about technological reality around the globe. And I would say at this point, I'm on the other side of the planet to learn about what's happening here. But I also want us to think about big, bold ideas. I, I, I'm sick and tired of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Right? The kinds of changes that we need in society today are far larger than the average decision maker can even comprehend. And again, the onus is on us to help dream that up and bring that about. I want to change minds. I want to both inspire, but also be challenged. I don't need like trolls. I just mean like, you know, really constructive, challenging ideas that make me think, oh wait, I hadn't thought of this that way. I want to brainstorm and especially I want to conspire. Like there is nothing like pints and a dark corner to make awesome happen. And so I think there's like pent up awesomeness here in this, in this community that I really wish to tap into. I want to interconnect and help others. I have a number of resources that I bring to bear. I'm interconnected with a global network of people that are doing amazing projects. And often it's like, I don't need more resources. I just need to better connect the ones that are available, both for my own projects, but I also hope for some of yours as well. And finally, I want to collaborate, not just here, but into the future. I love this idea of using this as a stepping stone, a platform for building some really wild, crazy, big ideas that we can then implement because we have the expertise and we have the ability to actually bring those changes about. So with that said, here's how you can follow up with me personally. I'm really looking forward to the next couple days. I am, of course, just the warm-up act, so I'm going to turn it over now to Brandon to continue to discuss sort of what GitHub is doing and some of the other things there. Thank you so much.